All right, we're going to get started. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, this is the webinar, Climate Quality in the Automotive Industry. Uh, my name is Henry Korn. I'm the Chief Product Officer of Imitest. And here's some of my contact information. If you'd like to follow up with me. Uh, so this is the agenda. We're going to talk about automotive image quality challenges. Uh, we'll talk about the IEEE P2020 image quality standard, the Imitest P2020 implementation status, and Imitest products that are related to automotive. So we'll start out with uh, the automotive image quality challenges. Uh, there are uh, fairly extreme environments that uh, cars work with. Uh, this is a, a high uh, range of illumination from uh, very bright uh, elements of the scene, such as the sun, uh, headlights, uh, to very dark uh, uh, scenes. And uh, so high dynamic range. Uh, we've got really bright, uh, bright sources in there, uh, including like traffic signals uh, and where you're driving into the sun or oncoming traffic, and uh, also a range of temperatures that uh, we work under uh, from very cold to very hot, uh, which can affect the sensor's performance. Uh, there's also uh, weather, things that can obscure the camera, such as rain, snow, sand, fog, uh, obscuring visibility. So uh, the challenge in putting together a camera system test plan uh, is to try to have some semblance of a connection to the uh, uh, reality of how, how your actual scene looks. So uh, a lot of times the kind of environment you reproduce in your lab is very kind of neutral and uh, you know gets you a good image. It doesn't necessarily test the extreme uh, environments of uh, how the camera is used on the road. So, that's, that's where uh, some new tests are necessary to try to uh, address the, the challenges of uh, reproducing that environment. Uh, there's also hardware system challenges, including uh, multiple cameras, synchronizing them with each other. We have lenses, fisheye lenses that are uh, very wide fields of view, uh, which can't fill uh, you can't fill that field of view with a conventional test chart. Uh, we have high dynamic range sensors, which uh, are of various technologies, and these are uh, challenging to test. Uh, we also have uh, connections to other camera types of sensors, uh, such as uh, the distance, depth, and motion sensors, obstacle detection, um, ultrasonic, radar, other kinds of sensors that you might uh, connect. To. Uh, and uh, so there are many different use cases where you might uh, want to uh, test a, uh, or that, that camera systems go into cars. There are the uh, hardware uh, applications, uh, the human viewing applications, and the machine viewing applications. So uh, there are, um, the, the first, first place we were working with automotive cameras are backup cameras. Uh, and then surround view cameras, and then camera monitor systems and mirror replacement systems. Uh, and then there's the machine, the machine vision side of things, uh, which uh, started with like kind of lane, lane keeping uh, tools and pedestrian detection, sign recognition, braking assistance, and autonomous driving. Uh, so the challenges of these two, uh, two different types of imaging are, are quite different. You have human perception on one side and then machine vision on the other. Uh, and as far as the testing challenges, there are many properties of the camera that make that testing hard. Uh, Nonlinear HDR, uh, non-global responses, uh, things like tone mapping in the image that, uh, or the processing that might confuse things, uh, different color filter arrays that you might be using on your sensor, uh, cameras that you don't actually have the ability to control the exposure of, those are uh, black box cameras. Uh, wide fields of view, long working distances, uh, response that is um, outside the visible spectrum, uh, different types of signal processors and signal processing, uh, 
either uh, low pixel counts or um, high, high bandwidth coming out of the, the camera devices. And uh, there's also uh, other ca uh, camera systems that aren't meant for imaging, such as LiDAR, uh, which may have conventional uh, sensors and lenses, but have other uh, kinds of uh, uh, hardware along with that that is, uh, uh, determines their performance. So uh, we are um, building solutions for uh, Imitest, we're building solutions for these kinds of test systems. And these include the, um, the, the older standards, the ISO standards, ISO 18844 and 16505, um, the flare and um, camera monitor system standards. And then uh, uh, more modern standards, which are in development right now, the IEEE P 2020. Uh, to go over this uh, flare measurement, which is kind of a little bit of a legacy thing, it is a, a, a target which works with uh, having a kind of very dark patches on a, a bright light source. Uh, so this uh, is a, a method of uh, measuring stray light uh, using um, a kind of a worst case scenario of, and nothing that is really resembling an actual scene. Uh, and so, uh, this is something which uh, it was the standard came out in 2015 and it uh, needs revision and it, it is in a revision right now and um, we'll be talking about some of the, the future revisions of that. There's also this uh, ISO 16505 camera monitor system test standard, uh, which uh, has a set of mandated uh, test charts. And uh, this includes not just the, the camera system test, but also the display and uh, the, the viewing of the display. Uh, and it does not include any sort of ADAS uh, measurement, uh, but we have some, some uh, limited support for this. Uh, so I will get into the P2020 automotive image quality standard next. Uh, there are a large number of companies, uh, organizations of all types that are involved in developing the standard and supporting the standard, uh, including uh, testing companies uh, such as Imitest, our, our competitors, we're working together on this, uh, uh, OEM and tier one automotive uh, suppliers and uh, test machine manufacturers, signal processing manufacturers, all kinds of companies. So uh, over 300, uh, participants, individual participants in the standard, and um, over 50 uh, people that are actually actively contributing. Uh, the organization of the standard is in subgroups. So there's uh, uh, six subgroups, uh, four of which are currently active. The uh, subgroup zero, kind of the overall image quality require requirements. Uh, subgroup one, which works on LED flicker. Subgroup two, image quality for viewing. Subgroup three, uh, image quality for computer vision. And uh, the, the other groups that aren't currently active, the subgroup four, camera systems interface, uh, image quality safety, and com customer perception of image quality. And the uh, image quality factors that are currently under development, which we will go over, are resolution, noise, dynamic range, flare or glare, LED flicker mit mitigation, and geometric calibration validation, and contrast detection probability. So the first metric we'll talk about is uh, resolution or spatial frequency response. The, the calculation that's being uh, uh, revised for this uh, the IP, IEEE P 2020 is based on the ISO 12233 uh, calculation. So there are some uh, adjustments to support high uh, wide field of views and uh, cameras with strong dis distortion. So uh, there is a uh, polynomial fit to the slanted edge. There is a linearization that happens using uh, OECF targets that are adjacent to the slanted edges. And uh, the, there's also some filtering using the two key window and some, some little technical details that are uh, being improved in that standard. So there are uh, methods of, I mean, the challenge of this test is uh, having a, a target that is 
presented at an appropriate working distance. And for automotive cameras, which have a tendency to be long focal lengths, the minimum focus distance may actually be uh, at you know, 10 meters or more uh, from uh, the camera to the chart. So that is a, a fairly large distance to be uh, testing and uh, especially challenging to fill the field of view of a camera uh, at that distance. So there are methods of um, using the target at a physical target at a long distance and taking multiple images of those and kind of compositing them together into a, a, a complete uh, measurement of the field of view. Uh, and then there are other methods of actually uh, coming up with a uh, virtual image to fill the field of view using a, uh, a, a target projection system. So uh, the, the MTF-10 uh, is typically the uh, metric associated with resolution. This is the frequency where uh, the, the camera system has lost 90% of the contrast um, compared to the low frequency uh, reference. Uh, so uh, that is, uh, uh, and if you have any questions about any of these things, uh, please feel free to uh, drop them in the chat. Um, we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Uh, the next metric I'll talk about is noise. Uh, this is the unwanted variation in digital outputs of the system. Uh, the P2020 noise measurement uh, work is based on uh, standards such as ISO 15739, uh, EMVA 1288, and ISO 19093, as well as the um, um, IEEE 1858 uh, visual noise. So there are um, as expansion of uh, environmental conditions, operating conditions, and procedures. Uh, for example, there's a, a case of kind of looking at noise in, in more of a kind of a tunnel uh, situation, uh, but typically this is measured from grayscale targets, um, such as the Imitest 36 patch dynamic range chart here. And uh, we, we look at the mean signal level uh, and then the signal to noise ratio or visual noise uh, at those uh, different uh, signal levels. So. Uh, depending on if we're working with um, machine vision, we'll use SNR. If we're like, working with human vision, we'll use that uh, ISO 15739 or the visual noise metric. Uh, next metric is the uh, geometric calibration validation. Uh, so this is based on uh, ISO 17850, uh, the uh, geometric distortion measurements, uh, and uh, there is a, the calibration is a mapping of the, the camera intrinsics or the pixel coordinates uh, and how they correspond uh, to actual positions in the, the, of the rays coming in in the real world to the camera. The validation uh, evaluates the, the calibration model by comparing that model and the camera behavior with each other. Uh, so to do this, we use a multi-target system uh, and these are uh, very precisely positioned uh, targets, uh, both in um, relative to each other as well as the distance. We um, we measure that and um, use a, a plan to capture and, and see the, see what the difference in these points are uh, across the image. And so there's a triangulation validation test, uh, forward and back project projection validation, as well as a, a key performance indicators of the pixel angle, the field of view, projected area pixels, and uh, projected linear pixels. And uh, this is something that we um, are currently offering as a service, which I'll talk about a bit later. For dynamic range, uh, this is uh, the metric that describes the range of scene luminances a camera can capture. Uh, so this is anywhere from the noise floor uh, up, up to the point of saturation and kind of measuring how many uh, steps of, uh, of uh, dynamic range uh, that scene luminance that you can uh, determine there. So uh, this is uh, adapting the, uh, to the needs of ADAS systems of high dynamic range up to 144 decibels 
uh, cameras with nonlinear responses, fisheye lenses, and also near infrared sensing. So uh, the measurements address uncertainty and, and defines the dynamic range at, of the camera system as the uh, 20 times the log base 10 of the, the maximum luminance uh, uh, divided by the, the minimum luminance. Uh, so this is an example test setup using a 36 patch uh, target and um, a, a backlit target. Uh, and you can see for uh, a long range camera and a wide field of view camera, you get a very different kind of test setup. Uh, and then from this, we plot the uh, signal to noise ratio uh, versus the input signal levels. And you, you may see that the signal to noise ratio actually changes or actually drops uh, between the different patches. And this may be because of um, exposure by um, different uh, pixels, um, different size pixels on the uh, sensor, if it's an HDR sensor. Uh, and you, um, a normal camera system will usually have a, a very linear kind of um, increase of SNR as you get to the brighter patches. Uh, so uh, the next metric I'll talk about is LED flicker. Uh, this is uh, a, a LED illumination brightness uh, is, is controlled by uh, pulse width modulation or PWM. And so this is a, uh, in, in digital imaging, the flicker is an artifact that occurs when uh, it's, it's flickering at a rate that the human system cannot see, but the camera does uh, uh, have some sampling problems uh, that uh, happen when looking at these kind of flickering light sources. Uh, so the, the pulse with modulated light source may flicker uh, on, or, or the image of that light source may flicker on and off if the exposure time of the camera is less than the reciprocal of the frequency of the light source. Uh, and this can be mitigated by LED flicker mitigation systems, which are part of uh, uh, modern HDR automotive sensors. And so you can see uh, some examples of this. The headlights uh, here, um, actually, who knows whether this is actually a turn signal or a headlight uh, or a, a, just a normal part of the headlight because it's, it's pulsing. So, um, we need to have the flicker mitigation so that this this kind of um, so you can read the signal lights dependently and uh, also determine the difference between a brake light and a turn signal. And uh, so this this often happens at very high illumination levels, uh, where the exposure time is uh, very very short, and uh, that that gives a, a higher uh, chance of the um, LED pulse not. Uh, coinciding with that exposure. And uh, the metrics being uh, devel developed for LED flicker are the flicker modulation index, uh, modulation mitigation probability, and flicker detection index. Uh, the last metric I'll talk about is, uh, actually, no, the second to last, uh, contrast detection probability, or CDP. Uh, this describes uh, the ability of imaging systems to determine how well certain input contrasts can be preserved or measured at the output. And so this is a combination of the, um, the OECF uh, as well as noise and flare and dynamic range. Uh, so uh, this is some examples of scenes uh, that have high contrast uh, and then uh, decreasing contrast and so you can see at some point if there's, uh, you know, there's glare, straight light in the image that can obscure the, uh, the ability to detect uh, items in the scene. And so we look at the kind of distribution between dark and bright, and you know, as these kind of start to overlap with each other, uh, then then that detectability goes down. Uh, and so uh, this is something where, like, if you map out the entire space of, of CDP. You can look at um, average luminance versus contrast, and you can see that at some point, you know, when you hit saturation, you lose contrast. Um, when you have a lot of noise or, or low contrast, you lose contrast. Uh, the CDP goes down, and there's kind of a, a sweet sweet spot where uh, you have good contrast detection, 
uh, at, at certain um, contrast and luminance values. Uh, we can measure this, uh, well, there's a, a bunch of different ways to measure this using any sort of co contrast. Uh, the, the system we've developed is uh, using this, uh, what's called the Imitest contrast resolution target, which has kind of low, low contrast patches in a range of different luminances. Uh, the next metric I'll talk about is the flare or glare, sometimes known as stray light. And this is a modification of the ISO 18844-C uh, and also ISO 9358 standards. Our camera captures light from the scene and, and, and stray light, and that causes a reduction in contrast or uh, other undesirable artifacts. Uh, so uh, the uh, we've ex the the standards committee IEEE P twenty twenty has expanded these to cover uh, fisheye cameras, uh, which uh, uh, basically taking this uh, this kind of bright bright field with dark spots on it and putting that in kind of a, a hemispherical uh, situation so it can work with those wide fields of view, and also looking at um, bright lights on a dark field uh, as kind of a um, more of a night scene uh, replica. Uh, and so the procedure is, you know, you can take the um, images of these charts uh, and um, calculate uh, flare using this equation, kind of looking at the, the contrast between uh, the signal level of the black and the signal level of the white, uh, the ratio between those. Uh, now, a, a more advanced measurement of uh, stray light and flare is using one of these uh, point sources that can move uh, across the field. And uh, at certain points, uh, there, there may be um, uh, artifacts that show up because of this light source. And so uh, this is where uh, some advanced equipment is necessary, which we're um, currently developing as our other vendors. Uh, and uh, the, the, the goal is to try to um, move a light source um, all around the image and also outside of the image where that uh, stray light can also be a problem or uh, creates, create aberrations in the image. Uh, so this can be uh, a, if, if you uh, sweep at, you know, angles of, of like one degree or less than one degree, this could end up being thousands of images that need to be analyzed to really get a comprehensive mapping of glare and flare. Uh, so uh, I guess it's a there's a there's a kind of a trade off between uh, simple measurements and and more advanced ones that are more comprehensive. And the um, I'll talk some more about um, this P twenty twenty. Well, it started in uh, uh, 2015, and uh, unfortunately not not getting launched uh, this year or the, the, the standard is not getting published this year, but um, we are, uh, the standard group is working on a pre-release. Uh, they're in the commenting on, on the pre-release right now, and um, they're intending to uh, in, uh, launch that pre-release uh, in the first quarter of next year. And, and uh, the, after the pre-release happens, then, then we have to work on the final release and all the publication uh, requirements for that, uh, which will likely take the final publication of the standard into the first half of 2023. I just want to give some thanks to the people that have um, been involved in producing the, the slides uh, that we've seen uh, before. Uh, AutoSense Academy, they have a, a, a much more detailed course on this called Measuring op and Optimizing Image Quality. Uh, and then as well as that, uh, uh, all the contributors to the, um, the P2020 standard, uh, the uh, chairs, editors, and all the subgroup uh, leaders that are part of that. So it's a, it's a big team effort. And um, yeah, we, uh, uh, it's really good to have all, all kinds of people in the industry working together uh, for um, hopefully improving safety and on the road. Uh, so next, I will talk about the uh, the the Imitest P twenty twenty implementation status. 
so I mean the standard the standard isn't complete yet. So uh, it's it's kind of it's hard to say that we fully support the standard before the standard is done being revised. So, uh, but we are working uh, on on coming into compliance with the standard and uh, the uh, or at least the pre-release version of it. So. Uh, there are, um, for each of the different areas, we've kind of uh, mapped out uh, in terms of charts, hardware, and software, what our, um, our, what our level of, you know, whether we support it, um, we're developing something in that area, or um, this is uh, to be done. So uh, when it comes to resolution, uh, there, are, there are some new charts that involve that OECF around this landed square. Uh, and also some some software updates needed to to support the the, the two key window on the um, uh, slanted edge calculation as as well as the linearization uh, with that OECF. Um, the test stand uh, is is good good to go for that. Um, for noise measurement, there is um, you can use our thirty six patch dynamic range uh, and light box. Uh, you'll you'll need the high illumination light box, one hundred thousand lux light box. Um, and light measurement uh, tools. Um, the software will need some updates to, to fully support noise. Uh, as far as geometry, right now, um, our geometry is a service we offer. So you send the cameras to us. I'll talk about that on the next slide. So uh, we, uh, we support that through a service, not, not through a, a product that we're selling. Uh, for dynamic range, uh, you can use the 36 patch dynamic range chart. But there's there's other charts that are um, being recommended by the standard as well, which are in uh, the design phase right now. Uh, it also uses that that very bright light box, and um, some some software updates will be necessary to fully support the uh, the uh, dynamic range. Uh, for the LED flicker, uh, there's a, a flickering light box in development. And that's going to be uh, the, the kind of target, the, the hardware and chart that will be used for that Flickr. Uh, and, and we hope to have that uh, you know, before the end of next year, uh, somewhere in the second half of the year. And um, we'll be also working on the software uh, for analyzing that. Uh, for Flare, uh, the um, uh, ISO 18844 update is uh, something that we need to do to have the proper chart. And we're also developing that fi fixture, uh, which actually some of these uh, images here were from some of our prototypes of that fixture that we're um, developing right now. And um, we'll, we'll have uh, uh, support for that in our software um, next year as well. Uh, contrast detection probability. Uh, we did have a kind of a pre-release version of that in Imatest 5.2 uh, uh, a couple years ago. And uh, it, uh, needs to be updated, uh, but the, the target you can use is the contrast resolution target. I'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, there's also the 36 patch dynamic range target, which you can use for um, less localized uh, uh, contrast. Um, and you'll need a light box and a light level measurement uh, hardware as, as, far, as far as that. So this is mostly just a software update that's necessary. Uh, I'll demonstrate or show our geometric calibration validation service. Uh, this is uh, where we compare uh, the, the actual location distance of these points to the, the model that uh, the, the camera system says it should have. And so uh, we, we perform these measurements across the field of view um, by using this kind of motorized gimbal system to um, move move the targets to the centers and corners so we can get uh, a good mapping of where there is this kind of error in projection uh, between points. And so that can kind of tell you like how good is your your calibration set up in your in your factory uh, uh, production line. Hopefully you're calibrating each camera individually if you want to get really accurate accurate um, kind of pos uh, indications of lane lane position and other features in the, in the in the image. Uh, so uh, this is something that uh, uh, we can evaluate at um, anywhere um, from 10 to 20 meters, uh, which is uh, approximately working distance that, that uh, many of our customers have uh, um, been concerned about. Uh, and 
if if you uh, need uh, your geometric calibration validated, we can also do some other uh, benchmarking at our facility uh, on those those samples, uh, such as uh, MTF and dynamic range uh, bench benchmarking along with that. Uh, so the, the last section here, um, actually we'll have a question and answer as well, uh, but uh, are Imitest products uh, related to automotive. So our uh, software is our uh, kind of where we started. Uh, Imitest Master is the version that has the user interface. Imitest IT can be automated it's with calls to a library. Uh, Imitest Ultimate is a license that has both master and IT in, together in one. Uh, we have uh, a lot of different kinds of equipment, which I'll uh, be going over, and uh, well, as, as well as a selection of test charts, which I'll uh, be um, briefly reviewing here. I want to leave plenty of time for questions. Uh, so our... Um, just to, wanted to share something about our software, a change we just recently made uh, last month. Uh, we, we produced this new main window interface, uh, which has fast startup, uh, uh, optimized uh, multi-image workflow. You can start with the, the image first uh, and also has a, a, a dark mode feature. So it's a kind of a new, uh, uh, new technology that we're working on uh, and uh, hopefully as much uh, more user-friendly than our, our previous main window. We're going to be extending this, uh, these improvements to the rest of our software in the coming year as well. Uh, so I'll talk about the Imitest modular test stand. So this is actually uh, not just one product, but kind of this ecosystem that we've uh, set up for test labs. And uh, it, in, it starts with the, the base module, which is this um, sliding rail and a camera holder that, that sits on that base module and uh, a chart holder. So the, uh, a, a real benefit of this is that you can ensure a parallel, uh, parallelness between the, uh, the test chart and the camera. So if you have, actually have a, a camera that might have tilt uh, or rotation in the um, sensor installed in the camera housing. By having knowing that your camera and chart are parallel, you can actually determine that um, you have that tilt problem inside of your module. Uh, if you're just using like a type tripod, putting uh, pointing that at a test target, you can't you can't ensure that. So that's that's uh, a big part of the value of this. So it's it's getting, uh, it's, the real purpose is to facilitate this repeatable camera. Uh, test target and light source positioning. And along with this, we have um, the reflective module, um, uh, various lights that uh, can go on to the uh, uh, reflective module, uh, near infrared, invisible, as well as um, uh, the, there's some other modules that I'll talk about here shortly. You can also adapt this to uh, light box testing. You can put a light box on the chart holder as well. Uh, and I should mention, there's a motorized version of this coming in uh, uh, early next year. Right now, it's uh, uh, mostly just a man manual operation. Uh, so the reflective module is this uh, attachment to the base module that has uh, supports uh, either these Kinoflow LED lights or the uh, metaphase uh, uh, near infrared lights. Uh, so Kinoflow are visible lights, metaphase are, are near infrared lights. Uh, this has kind of um, angle and position markers that um, allow you to kind of set your lights in one spot and kind of lock them down uh, and um, be able to retrieve the positioning of those lights. And so um, there's about a well, 1.5 meter travel distance here. Uh, so you can get higher illumination if you move close uh, or wider illumination if you move further away. Uh, the uh, wide field of view module is a uh, another uh, add-on. This is this is you wouldn't have the reflective and wide field of view on the same thing. You'd you'd want use either one or the other. You can't switch between them, but that's that takes some work. 
Uh, so uh, the, the wide field of view module is for uh, obviously testing wide fields of view up to 200 degrees. And uh, it has this kind of polar uh, coordinate system for positioning these uh, what are called SFR rag targets in the periphery of the field of view. So you'd have kind of a center target and then you these, these uh, uh, targets on the outside of the field of view. Uh, so uh, for, for wide field of view camera systems, generally the focal length is fairly short. So um, 1.5 meters may be beyond the hyperfocal distance of some of these systems. And uh, so that can uh, make it uh, uh, a reasonable um, test setup for those wide cameras. Uh, so uh, there's also, uh, we, we light this reflectively using the, the same sort of uh, illumination as the reflective module, but we do that actually behind the camera uh, and um, it's necessary to use matte targets so there's no specular reflection on those targets. Uh, there is a, uh, for achieving very low light uh, situations, there is a filter that goes over the, uh, these luminaires, these KinoFlow luminaires. This is called our low light filter. Uh, this is, um, lets you go down um, close to uh, half a lux at that 1.5 meter distance that the reflective module uh, uh, offers. And this greatly increases the range of illumination that um, these reflective test chart setups can uh, have. Um, the linear motion blur module is another uh, uh, tool that, or a mechanical stage that attaches to the MTS. This is a sliding target uh, that has uh, about 1.1 meters of travel and up to three meters per second speed. So uh, this can also kind of you can, you can use this as a sort of a proxy for testing rolling shutter by looking at the edge angle and the change of that. And uh, this is um, actually, we developed this for uh, some non automotive applications, but I think it could be useful for automotive as well, although it's not currently part of the standard. Uh, next, I'll talk about the, uh, the Imitest collimator fixture. Uh, and this is uh, if you have one of those uh, long focal length cameras uh, that is hard to um, get within the minimum working distance inside of a, a compact test lab. Uh, so this, this fixture uh, works by uh, having a, um, a collimator lens and a, a test target um, backlit, and this is sitting on the Imatest LED light panel. And um, depending on what the distance uh, is set between this, this um, collimator and the, um, the chart, um, that determines what the virtual object distance is. So um, there's also, so there's a mechanical stage to, to precisely control that distance and also um, stages that control the position of the unit under test. And uh, depending on what uh, your camera system you're using, this can cover up to 120 degrees um, field of view uh, camera systems or lenses. And this is kind of an idea of what it looks like your, your physical target is there, but through the, in, through the collimator, uh, you see this, this target that appears to be at a much longer distance. Um, this uh, supports uh, many different types of um, lenses, uh, both uh, visible and infrared uh, light. And I think that one of the one of the many factors is the, um, the, the entrance pupil size of your, your camera. So um, the, the widest uh, lens here uh, works uh, with a, a 4.5 millimeter entrance uh, pupil. Um, it can support a, a 4.5 millimeter entrance pupil lens uh, and up to 120 degrees. Uh, now, if your camera is uh, larger than 4.5 millimeters entrance pupil, well, you can still use this, but you may not be testing the full extent of that lens. You may be just kind of testing the inner area. So um, if you have a wider field, uh, if you have a, um, a entrance people up to 15 millimeters, then, then you can, we can support up to a 70 degree field of view there. And um, we can produce uh, virtual objects just uh, at a, up to an infinite distance uh, with this uh, 
target projection system. Uh, this system does use this uh, LED light panel. Uh, actually, the wider the field of view, the larger target you need uh, for this system. So um, the biggest one of these uh, uses this um, 900 by 680 millimeter uh, uh, light panel. Uh, so this light panel is a kind of affordable uh, backlit illumination system for test charts. Uh, goes up to a hundred uh, or a thousand lux, and um, depending on the model, it has up to um, ninety or ninety-five percent uniformity. The Imatest LED light box is a uh, much brighter and has many more uh, options for illumination. Um, so this is uh, more for the HDR testing. You might just use the light panel just for say, a basic resolution test. Uh, so this light box can work for, um, it has rails that uh, the test target goes, uh, is inserted in. Uh, it, it um, the kind of standard version of it allows you to mix between uh, 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 different color temperatures and um, kind of dial in what color temperature you wanna have. Uh, there's also IR uh, illumination options that are available. And uh, this has up to 95% uniformity. Uh, so the kind of chart that, that you'll use on this uh, high illumination box, oh, I should mention, um, it goes as low as 30, 30 lux and up to either 10,000 or 100,000 uh, lux intensity. Uh, if you have a system that you have full control of, I mean, 100,000 lux is, Kind of like the um, the kind of illumination that you'll have in a in a bright outdoor scene. Uh, so, but it's it's quite uh, it's quite more expensive to get that um, very bright level of illumination. Uh, if you have full control of your camera system, you can uh, take the ten thousand lux uh, light box and just take a longer exposure of that uh, light box to kind of uh, get an equivalent uh, sort of uh, simulation of that 100,000 lux intensity. But if you have a black box system, you can't really do that. So you might, you might need the brighter a box to really, really test dynamic range. Uh, so these are the kind of targets that are used on these uh, light boxes. Uh, the, the, these are kind of the conventional 36 patch high dynamic range uh, test charts. We offer them in a range of different um, dynamic ranges and depending on the number of layers that we have on the, the, the darker portion of this, um, that's how we um, uh, have these three different versions. One that goes up to 150 decibels, which we've never really seen any camera that can actually resolve that much dynamic range in a single scene. Um, most cameras are somewhere around, or high dynamic range cameras, um, just because of the quality of the lenses. Um, for the system, they're, they're somewhere around 100 decibels of, of dynamic range. Although most of our customers will just kind of hope to get more than 100 dB of dynamic range and, and purchase this highest dynamic range target. So, I mean, these are uh, meant to kind of um, be somewhat representative of a, a day scene where you have light coming in at all angles of the camera and you uh, have, uh, um, then that, that makes it easy for auto exposure, um, but it also creates a lot of flare light, which can uh, reduce the dynamic range of um, uh, your system in, in that sort of scene. Uh, so um, there is an alternative of what we call a dark world mask, where you can kind of create a night scene by masking out most of the bright stuff in the target and just, just leaving the measurement patches uh, on their own. And that can, um, you may see that um, because of the effects of flare light that you have um, greater dynamic range from the dark scene than you have from the, the kind of um, gray scene. Uh, next, I will talk about the contrast resolution chart. Uh, this is uh, what we have uh, developed for testing the contrast detection probability. This has uh, 20 regions 
uh, with kind of local sub areas that have small density differences or a two to one contrast or transmittance uh, difference between these, these kind of dark and light areas in each patch. Uh, so uh, currently this has a 95 decibel density range. We're gonna need to increase that uh, to meet the, the demands of the sensor manufacturers, whether or not the lenses can actually keep up with that is a different story, but uh, this is uh, meant to determine the useful dynamic range of your system uh, with um, this new key performance indicators of either contrast resolution signal to noise ratio or the contrast detection probability measurement. So uh, the um, similar to the, the 36 patch dynamic range, we have a, a mask that we just released for this, which can cut out a lot of that flare light. And so um, a, um, what we're, we're calling it the veiling glare mask uh, for a contrast resolution. And you can, so you can get a uh, approximation of uh, flare light or veiling glare of your system by, um, Evaluating the dynamic range uh, with and with without and with that with that mask, and uh, we're going to be uh, sharing something about that very very soon here. And um, next, I'll um, so these last few targets we have here are kind of our conventional test targets uh, uh, based on the ISO standards. Uh, I'm not going to go into any much detail about them in, unless there's there's questions about that. So. Um, ESFR ISO, uh, SFR plus, these are very common charts in, in both R&D and manufacturing. And you've seen the SFR reg targets on um, the high resolution or the, the wide field of view fixture. And these can also be used with target projectors uh, uh, for um, wide field of view collimating tests as well. And um, some other equipment that uh, we'll have in our lab, uh, there's a Tunable light sources, uh, and these um, can be used to simulate uh, CIE illuminance and daylight with higher, higher accuracy than conventional lights. Uh, there is also wide field of view light sources, uh, or uniform light sources that go uh, above, uh, beyond 300 degrees for measuring uniformity of wide, wide cameras. There's uh, light measurement uh, systems for you know, measuring light level, color temperature, or um, we have a spectral radiometer for getting a, a very detailed spectral response curve. Uh, also some things like uh, camera timing tests and uh, robotic automation. Um, lots of different equipment we have. Uh, you can see at imatest.com slash equipment. Uh, so that is the uh, end of the presentation and I'm uh, happy to uh, answer any questions that you have. Uh, if you prefer, you can uh, paste them in the chat or you can take yourself off of mute. And um, I should also mention that we have a um, an office hour session uh, every two weeks, uh, a, a couple different times. So um, if you ever have questions, you, uh, you're welcome to bring those to the office hour. And let's see, do we have any questions? Okay, I'm going to hang out and uh, I, I hope this is a good use of your time. Uh, I appreciate you attending. Um, I'm just going to paste some, some things in the chat here. Um, the weekly office hours sessions are um, uh, available here. And so if I don't have any questions, then uh, it looks like we do have a question here from Isaac, uh, for ISO 16505, which tests do you plan to cover on Imatest Master? Uh, okay. So our, um, the current level of support for ISO 16505 is described in this, um, this page. Uh, and uh, what we are currently supporting on it is mostly the um, analysis of the resolution uh, and which uses um, slanted edges and checkerboards. Uh, so here's an example of the 16505 slanted edge target. Uh, and um, 
there's also a grayscale target uh, and uh, uh, checkerboard you can use to also uh, measure distortion. Uh, and then there's a color measurement we've adapted uh, for this, uh, which is a particular type of chromaticity, this UV uh, chromaticity. Uh, so there's, there's other uh, parts of the standard that we do not support yet. Uh, there's, there's some, the tiny measurements, there's uh, uh, the uh, field of view measurement of um, kind of odd, odd shaped uh, systems uh, from your replacement. Uh, so currently we are focused not on mirror replacement camera systems, but for the autonomous driving systems, which we think are um, going to have much more impact on safety. So I would say um, I, I wish we had complete support for this standard. It is um, quite a difficult standard. Uh, if you've read it, it's quite complicated and, and, and very convoluted in some areas. And so offering complete support for that has been uh, somewhat of a struggle for us. Um, we do have a Japanese um, partner of ours that, that may be able to provide some testing services for that um, and provide um, broader support than we currently have, but it's not on our immediate roadmap to, um, or even a medium term roadmap to fully support that standard. I'm, I'm sorry, sorry to say. Okay, well, I think that uh, that will conclude the webinar. I appreciate you all coming and uh, have a fantastic rest of your week and happy holidays.